back everyone this is the state of the nation now i want to continue this discussion on sri lanka's economy now last friday the central bank announced that they would keep the lending facility rates at 15.5 percent and what does that mean does this mean uh, that everything is going to go increase again and joining me now is uh danny dutan at the data board and good to see you once again uh, thank you very much for being here now i know you were analyzed what the uh, central bank uh, was saying uh, especially the governor uh, last friday uh, in the evening when they were talking about the interest rates uh, uh, right now uh, what exactly did you learn and uh, what i really want to understand is what does that mean because you know there are lots of jargon which we which has been used uh, in current conversation when explaining economic theories and economic matters but the normal person doesn't understand i don't understand so what exactly does that mean that the standard lending facility rate is uh, kept at 5 15.5% uh, yes mahesh uh, now a small correction there it was the standing deposit facility rate that was raised to actually 15.5% from 14.5% the standard lending facility rate now stands at 16.5% that is a 100 basis point increase now just to give an overview of what exactly this means mahesh we see that this standard lending facility rate is used as the instrument through which the banks get to control the interest rates of other commercial banks that lend to the people in in in, in their off right uh, because the specific way the, the, this is the only specific instrument that can be used by the central bank to do that regard the lending facility rate specifically dictates what exactly is the interest rate that the banks can borrow from from the central bank now that's a pretty specific area that we will be dealing with now what is required in understanding this specific uh, basis point increase is the, is the intention by the central bank to keep a control on the inflation that is what the imf has been dictating quite for quite some time increase the interest rates so that there's less liquidity in the markets so that as a total the inflation would go down we see that this is us following the imf trajectory without any form of uh, concerns without any form of flags given before we have been speaking to a lot of economists and even they couldn't really understand understand why they went for not only keeping it at the same level but increasing it by 100 basis points or do you mind indeed uh, as always that is one of us on the data board oh uh, wait i think there's something uh, you have something new coming up isn't it there's a new program of yours coming up uh, very shortly i think next week around what, what exactly is that Yes Mahesh uh, so thank you for giving me this opportunity <laughs> uh, we are going to talk about these issues from both sides and we believe that that kind of conversation is required in these specific days so the public square will be introduced to the viewership i don't want to give away too many details I want the viewers to come in and see have a taste of what this public square is going to look like we're going to bring debate back into this channel indeed uh, um, something to look forward to uh, that is with Anwar Samas always at the data board thank you very much Now last year the former governor of the central bank was accused harassed ridiculed and shamed by the empty headed colombo liberals led by several mouthpieces of the IMF to whom they give money to their so called think tanks and the argument was that the former governor was printing so much money due to that inflation was skyrocketing in comes the current governor does the same thing no ha hu from those empty uh, headed liberals because now the current governor is very much on board to implement whatever the imf says when the former governor was holding the dollar this country's inflation was also stable go please have a look at the data but once the former governor listened to those empty headed liberals who called uh, to float the rupee the inflation skyrocketed and those empty headed liberals and their think tanks immediately changed their tune no accountability for the bull they said the current governor uh, does the same to hold the rupee after understanding that floating the rupee was not the best way forward because he is holding the rupee the inflation is also stabilizing bouquets for the current governor and sticks and stones for the former by the very idiotic colombo liberals The IMF which is having a great time using all uh, its textbook solutions seems not to be going anywhere and common sense from our lawmakers doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon. Let's get a better understanding of what we are facing right now. Joining me now is the director of Prime Economics and Politi- uh, and also a political economist Dr. Anne Pettifer. She is in London at the moment. and joins me via zoom thank you very much doctor for your time now as of now when we look at countries uh, that the imf has worked with worldwide we see a similar and alarming pattern doctor 
The IMF has the, solu uh, the same solution. Increase taxes, try to balance the budget and cut subsidies. Yet those solutions continue to fail those countries every single time. Doctor, I'm trying to understand why such a powerful organization continuously pushes for erroneous policies and why these countries blindly follow them. What do you think is their hold in implementing these uh, fateful policies? So Mahesh, what we need to understand just to the beginning of this conversation is that the IMF is an agent for international creditors, both official creditors, i.e. the government of China and India, to which Sri Lanka owes money, but also private creditors, which includes BlackRock and hedge funds and so on and so forth. And what the IMF, they like a gatekeeper. They are the ones who determined how a country can get access to dollars, essentially, because that's the global reserve currency, uh, to for whatever the country may want. Um, so when they what they're trying to do when they impose the policies that you speak of is to, if you like, mobilize savings at home to gather as much money as we can here at home in order to pay those foreign creditors. That's the, uh, 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 the aim of the IMF. The IMF's aim is not to increase, if you like, economic activity in Sri Lanka. It's not to in improve well-being in Sri Lanka. It's not to end poverty in, in uh, Sri Lanka. It's not interested in any of those things. It's interested in paying international creditors, and it manages that process for those creditors. Now, the question is, why is Sri Lanka in that system? And the reason is because we, knew, we live within, if you like, a, a, a global house. Let's think about it in those terms. And the architecture of that house is designed to make sure that countries orient their economies towards the interest, if you like, of global capital, right? And so, you know, the the priority of governments is not to, if you like, maintain and, and, and improve economic activity at home, it's to gain access to global capital. And we, that's how we've been oriented. We have to come back to an emphasis on the domestic economy, on Sri Lanka itself. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for explaining it that way, uh, Doctor. Now, with the IMF program coming into uh, play in Sri Lanka, uh, we will once again get the access to borrow money, hence it will continuously increase our debt. Now, we see signs of a global recession and a possibility of a full-blown war uh, on the scale of, of, of World War III possibly occurring. Now, what should we be mindful of in an instance like that uh, for a country, especially like Sri Lanka? So my view, and uh, it's difficult for Sri Lanka because of this burden of debt and because the creditors have such power over the Sri Lankan economy. But in my view, what Sri Lanka should, government should be doing now is focusing on the interests of the people of Sri Lanka, the majority, essentially, and improving the economy, increasing the number of jobs created, stimulating investment in jobs and so on, to improve living standards and raise income at home. Now, that's quite difficult. I mean, Sri Lanka has problems. Uh, a big bunch, a big share of the budget goes to the military. It seems to me the military are not economically productive. Uh, they're engaged in activity which doesn't generate, if you like, new income, new investment. It gets spent, if you like, in, in activity which is not helpful to the economy. So it's about changing the uh, the Sri Lankan economy, but, but also putting a focus on being more self-sufficient at home. I see there's a big problem for farmers with fertilizer. Well, what is the answer to, is there an alternative to chemical fertilizers that have to be imported? Surely, what is what did farmers do before, first of all, the invention of chem chemical fertilizers and be an export oriented economy? What did we what did Sri Lankan farmers do before? Now, we, probably they were not as productive as they are with chemical fertilizers, but ways have to be found to make Sri Lanka more self-sufficient in food and in energy, renewable energy, for example, and all of those essential resources for the health of the people of Sri Lanka, not for the health of international creditors, of big capital markets. Indeed, it makes a lot of sense. Now, finally, Doctor, in your opinion, 
what kind of alternative economic models should Sri Lanka be thinking of uh, to be economically independent and to change its status from a developing nation to a developed one and basically get out of this crisis? So Sri Lanka is in a very weak position. The economic model that we want is to change the house that we live in. We live in a house where the interests of the 1%, the wealthy, are prioritized. So we want to live in a new house, but Sri Lanka can't build a new architecture herself. It needs international cooperation and coordination. It needs low income countries to come together and decide to operate in a different way, not in a way that just suits the interest of the 1%, but in a way that, now we had that, we had that architecture between 1941 and 1971, 1945 and 71, and we called it the Bretton Woods system. And under that system, Sri Lanka pro prospered and did many other developing low-income countries. So we could we could build a house very much like the Bretton Woods house, but unfortunately, Sri Lanka can't do that on her own. It requires coordination. We need a south-south uh, solidarity team, if you like, to build to start, come together to demand a new international architecture, which enables Sri Lanka to become more self-sufficient and more self-reliant and thereby to raise the level, of, the level of education or the living standards of her people at home, rather than improving the living standards. For example, Mr. Gautem Adani, whose group has just bought the, the port of Colombo. You know, that man has got more money than he ever needs to have. But the, the new, uh, the architecture we live within benefits him. It doesn't benefit the people of Sri Lanka. That has to change. Indeed. Uh, listening to uh, you, Doctor, and many other uh, um, economists who actually have better solutions than the one we are establishing right now, uh, I wonder we really need to give a lot of uh, education to our people here in Sri Lanka. We have to leave it at that. Thank you very much. That was the Director of Prime Economics and, uh, per, and also Political Economist, uh, Dr. Anne Pettifer. We will take a short commercial break. This is the State of the Nation. Back in a moment.